Good evening. Yesterday, a scathing report into parties in Downing Street over lockdown. Today, a raft of cost of living measures announced by the Chancellor. We've waited five months for the full Sugre report and it didn't hold back. The document detailed a casual disregards for the rules during the lockdowns and the Prime Minister was forced to apologise but it comes at a time of struggle, of economic hardship for much of the country. And so the pressure was on the Chancellor today to ease that pain. But do they understand? Are the Tories, as many say they are, out of touch? Cabinet Minister Jacob Rees-Mogg has led a privileged life and he's not afraid to speak his mind. Let's see what he has to say. Also ahead, the story of Darren. He struggled during lockdown with work and turned to crime as a source of income, but paid the ultimate price, being badly burnt after he was electrocuted. He's now awaiting world first surgery and has a message for people who might consider taking the same path. Plus, it's a drama following a family of divorce lawyers with four women as the main characters, and you'll be hard-fetched to find people who haven't been gripped by it. We speak to the director and one of the lead actors of The Split. Jacob Rees-Mogg is one of the best-known and most controversial figures in this government. A hardline Brexiteer, his views often divide opinion and he always speaks his mind. He's now a cabinet minister and so has unique access to government decisions, a government under pressure of party gate scandal and a cost of living crisis. And with a big announcement from the Chancellor today, I spoke to him about what that means for the country, but also about what drives him in politics. Uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, thanks so much for talking to me today. I really appreciate it. And I've got lots to talk about. There's lots going on in the news uh, about uh, the Sue Gray report, The Cost of Living. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about you and your political outlook. Um, and there's lots of things about you viewers might not know, that you were a hugely or are a hugely successful investment banker before you came into politics. Uh, you married into wealth. You and your wife, Helena, have six children. You're a devout Roman Catholic. Yours is a very fortunate and fulfilled life. So... Why politics? A um, number of reasons. One is that if you have been very fortunate in life, you might feel that you've got a duty to do something about it if you've got the opportunity to do it. So that's the sort of pious reason. Mm. But there's then the fact that it is enormously and captivatingly interesting. So I enjoy doing it, but I also think I have an element of duty to do it. And just in terms of your political career, you are in Cabinet, you're one of the most well-known faces, actually, I would argue, of the Conservative Party. Often it's quite difficult for politicians to get cut through, but you do have cut through. Um, but you've also become a touch paper a bit, if you don't mind me saying, at times. And you're, you're a divisive politician sometimes. Lots of people really, really like you, uh, but you also come in for quite a lot of criticism. D does it surprise you, and, and why, do you, why do you think that is? Oh, well, I think if you're in politics, you must expect that people will disagree with you, and will disagree with you strongly on important issues. Mm. So, if you take Brexit, Brexit was very divisive for, for the country, and people who were in favour of it really wanted to get our independence back, felt that was fundamentally important. People on the other side of the argument felt, in some cases, that something they had worked for their whole political careers was being removed and were very upset about that. So if you're in politics, surely you want to put forward your views, you want to put them forward as clearly mm. as possible, and then you're going to find people disagree with you. You could be a Lib Dem and say whatever people want here, and then you hope that nobody will either like you or dislike you. There doesn't seem to me to be a lot of point in that. And before I get on to what type of Conservative you are, just, just to finish off in this idea of the divisiveness which you acknowledge, does it does it bother you? I mean, I saw that you were heckled at a university uh, during Brexit. I think your family were bothered while they were with you. Do you just see that as the ugly underbelly of politics, or do you actually think that it's a kind of corrosive aspect of public life? Does it upset you when you mm. personally experience things like that? No, because I'm a great believer in freedom of speech. Right. And I think that nobody made me go into public life. Your opening question was, why mm. did I do it? 
I have decided to go into public life, therefore people are entitled to disagree with me, mm. and they're entitled to disagree with me forcefully, and they are entitled to wave banners mm. at me. Uh, as long as it isn't physical intimidation, I think it is perfectly legitimate for politicians to mm. face argument about what they believe in. Um, Steve Bray is entitled to stand in the middle of the road and shout nonsense all day long because that's what he believes mm. in and that's freedom of speech. And I do worry, actually, that we don't protect freedom of speech as much as we ought to in this country. And um, what type of Conservative are you? Um, what type of Conservative am I? Well, I believe in um, freedom of the individual, the starting point, and most things flow from that, that I believe that it's people's own money, not the government's money, and therefore people should be entitled to keep their own money as far as possible. Low tax. Low tax, that they should make decisions about their own lives with as little interference uh, from the state as is practical. Small state? A small state, yes. Would you like to see a more closer link between the church and the state, between politics and the church, or do you think that these things should remain separate? I think we've got it about right in this country. Um, I'm not an Anglican, mm. but I like the fact that the Anglican Church is the established church. It maintains a place for God within our civic society. So Remembrance Sunday, the Anglican Church leads it. Um, there will be the service for 70 years of the Queen's reign, the Platinum Jubilee. That will be led by the Anglican Church. Uh, I think the position of the Archbishop of Canterbury is a, is a very important one. And I, it may surprise you, I happen to be a great admirer of the Archbishop, so I think he is a good and holy man. But even when he makes political interventions, because he, he gets very criticised by many of your colleagues for when he does that. I, I think you can admire and respect people even when they say things that you would rather they didn't say. So this doesn't mean I adopt all his political views. It may even mean I disagree strongly with them. But I think he is um, a force for good in society. And I, I think he's a genuinely holy man, actually. Do you think he should be allowed to say it, though? I believe in freedom of speech. Of so course he should do, be allowed to say I, it. The reason I ask is that many of your colleagues... I, 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 there was a recent example, and a number of your colleagues... I think you might have been critical about the Prime Minister around the Partygate issue. I think that might have been it. I can't quite remember. A number of your colleagues were... Maybe in the borders. He it wasn't was the very, border policy. Yeah, forgive me. The border policy, he was very critical of, wasn't he? And a lot of your colleagues said that this was inappropriate. And actually, there was a bit of a pile-on towards the Archbishop. You don't agree with him I, being I, silenced in that way. Uh, he must make his own statements um, and must be free to say what he wants. I didn't agree with him, but I went to the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, Vincent Nichols' um, homily at the Red Mass, which is the Mass to begin the legal year. Mm. And he stood in the pulpit. It was an absolutely magnificent sermon he gave. He said, look, you're very important judges, and you judge all these important cases. But don't forget, there's a higher judge who will judge you one of these days. And so if I like it when clerics say things that make people sit up and think when I agree with them, I shouldn't be too squeamish mm. when they say things that make pe people sit up and think that I don't agree with. Mm, that's reasonable. And, and Jacob, just on another sort of political, personal issue. Just one more thing on this. Ro Roe versus Wade, I was interested in this about what you might have felt about this. It was the landmark legislation that legalised abortion across... It wasn't legislation. The, sorry to be sorry, pedantic. It was a, it, it, a case. That's sorry. Right. It was a case that the Supreme Court ruled on. But my pedantry is very important because that wasn't democratically decided. And that seems to me to have been... The, the source of all the trouble, whereas this country decided it democratically. Yes. I'm sorry to Sorry, no, no, that's, that's absolutely, completely fine. Um, but you wouldn't want to ban abortion. Um, there's no prospect of Parliament voting to ban abortion, but I think the numbers are just the saddest aspect of modern British life. The saddest? The sad... 200,000 babies that aren't born... This is, this is so sad. Des this loss of life that would otherwise be created, I think, is desperately sad. Now, we were just talking, you are a small state, low-tax Conservative. Today, a £37 billion package just announced by the Chancellor. Is it your view that the public, particularly following Covid, are now too reliant on the government and the state to solve problems? That this pack is just, when does it stop? 
Well, this is in a way a continuation of the COVID problem. Mm. I was very strongly in support of the furlough scheme and other schemes like that because the government is there when everything else is collapsing. Mm. And if the government hadn't provided furlough, hadn't provided loans to businesses, we would have had no economy to come back to when things reopened. Uh, and that would have been even more inflationary than what we've currently got. Currently, the disruption to supply chains, made worse by war in Ukraine, made worse um, uh, by the rise in fuel prices, um, is an aftershock mm. of COVID, very much like the aftershocks that you mm. get with, with an earthquake. Uh, and the government cannot leave people completely unable to pay their fuel bills. So the state has a role. Mm. David Davis and John Redwood just in the chamber have warned already about inflationary risks, about today's measures. Do you see their concerns? Do you share them? Well, I see their concerns. And as I say, I think this is a balancing act that, that it would be foolish of me to pretend is easy to, to get right. Mm. And on another, let's just get through the measures that he just now. Mm. He's also announced his temporary level on the profits of oil and gas companies at a rate of 25%, all but in name a windfall tax. You've been openly against a windfall tax, haven't you? Well, um, importantly, it is not retrospective. Retrospective taxation is, to my mind, entirely mm. improper, that people mm. must be taxed on what yes. they know is going to come. So that's an important change. But if you... You don't sound that... You, it's not... You, it's collective response, I understand that. I support that, government policy. You support government policy, but have you changed your mind? Because you were against it. But this is what I said to you earlier. I think mm. collective responsibility is fundamentally mm. important and that ministers um, are right to argue for what they believe mm. in private yes. and then accept the conclusion when it comes out. Yes. The contextualisation I'm trying to give... Mm is that these are not easy decisions. It is a balance. It is really important to protect people and help people who would simply have no money mm. if the fuel price increase went up and they received no help, uh, and pensioners as well. And, and the, the welfare state does have an obligation to look after people in that position. But How you then pay for it, well, is one tax better than another tax? Well, I was actually... Uh, well, actually, let's come to that then, because... Um, I had something that I, I wanted to ask you about that, which is, um, as a wealthier person in society, as I am as well, do you think that we have, wealthier people, a moral duty to help people that are less well off, whether that's through taxation, so wealthier people pay more, or through philanthropy? Oh, of course I do. I mean, this, to, to go back to the discussion we were having on religion, this is one of the fundamental tenets of, of Christianity. Expand? Well, you, you um, should love thy neighbour as thyself. Um, the the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan, um, who is my neighbour? Well, everybody is my neighbour. So there, there, there is a, a responsibility to help others in and society. Does it alarm you? I was looking today. Uh, two million people in the UK need to use food banks. One in five people, according to YouGov this morning, now say they're struggling to, or unable to make ends meet. That's a 10% rise on last year. And half of households say their financial situations have deteriorated in the last year alone. It's quite worrying, isn't it? It, it? it is very worrying. Inflation is terribly worrying because inflation hits the least well-off most. That's why the Chancellor's been doing mm. what he has been doing today. It's why the support packages are very important. Mm. And the difficulty with our current welfare system is that some benefits are uprated retrospectively. So if you have a year of inflation, yeah. you get the uprating in the um, April of the yes. following year yeah. on the September figure. Now, over a multi-year period, that balances out. Yeah. But in an individual year when inflation is running at a rapid rate, that is really difficult for people, which is why the Chancellor it's has bringing... made... Uh, that, that's right. It, it's bringing forward a help that otherwise might so not come you, through. Until... So you would, even though you sort of philosophically, ideologically, might not be in favour of increased taxation, increased spending to support people, at this moment in time, because of inflationary pressure, you're OK with it, basically? Well, it also mean, depends on what you mean by increased expenditure, because how are you judging this expenditure? Well, I so, mean... So, but, but, 
you're bringing, I mean, bringing forward benefits but, is just but, moving the money forward while the inflation's but higher. If, if inflation is running at 10% and you have um, a GDP growth, which is always real terms growth mm. of zero, mm. the government still has expenditure as a percentage of GDP, yeah. if it remained flat, mm. would be reduced mm. proportionately. Mm. So in an inflationary time, there is money that is available in a strange way mm. that wouldn't otherwise be available. be available whilst keeping expenditure level proportionate to GDP. You then have to ask yourself the question, as does that expenditure risk becoming yes. more inflationary itself? Yeah. I think saying that supporting the least well off is inflationary is a mistake. I think you, you may need to look at other areas of expenditure, but you surely want to help those who, who are absolutely squeezed first by inflation. At the other big news this week was Sue Gray's report. You said in March concerns over Partygate and Downing Street were fluff and fundamentally trivial. That was in March. Do you still think that, having read the report? What have we been discussing? We have been discussing inflation, the fact that some people may not be able to um, make ends meet. Uh, we haven't discussed Ukraine, but the whole security of the Western world has been at risk over the last few months. Uh, and I, I, I think the um, intellectual energy spent on Partygate has been completely disproportionate. But, do you, but having read the report, do you still think it's trivial? Um, what happened is Well, trivial. I'm afraid I'm going to say the same to you, because you had an incident where you were at a, a party. I did. Uh, and you apologised for it. And I offered and, to resign. And, for, I and, offered and, my resignation and, as well. And I sent you a message saying I hope it didn't... No, you were you know, very kind to because me. Because I thought, I thought the reaction to you was disproportionate. But I didn't think it, was tri it wasn't trivial. I'm, I'm asking you if you thought I'm, it was trivial. I'm consistent in my view. I think the reaction to you was disproportionate. I think the reaction over Partygate is disproportionate. And I think the reaction to Sakir Starmer is disproportionate. Um, that, that so many really important things are going on uh, that we need to get on with. Um, the, the Prime Minister um, got a fine for what seemed to be one of the least things that went on mm. uh, in Downing Street. Some of them that are in the report didn't even go on in Downing Street. They were in the Cabinet Office, which is not where the Prime Minister mm. is. The events the Prime Minister was at were daytime events. It, it, it seems to me... Too much has been made of it when so many other important things are going on. And the Prime Minister has apologised. But, Jacob, just, just one other follow-up on this, if you don't mind. In that report, there were reports of staff vomiting after too much alcohol, a drunken altercation, think, red, wa uh, uh, red wine on the walls, rudeness it, to security staff. I mean, well, 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 can you imagine the, the, behaving like that at work? The, the, um, as I understand it, the... the um, vomiting and the fight were a party in the cabinet office which is no, a set I'm, I'm which not, is a is I'm a asking set. about it more broadly okay. not I'm not but, asking you directly about the prime minister but that's but that's quite that's quite important because it all relates to the prime yeah. minister to make it clear which I think has been that what sounds to have been the worst incident was actually not in Downing Street at all well there were there was, was another one in Downing Street in before separate, Prince Philip's building but, which but was look terrible I, but, but, I'm just asking you more broadly it must mortify you I mean do you not find that morally abhorrent I think it's absolutely disgraceful being rude to um, the um, people who are providing essential services in a government building um, but we know that only two elected politicians were fined out of the mm. 83 and it was neither of the two elected politicians who were rude to, to the staff you know, so um, again, this is not a culture encouraged by the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister would never be rude to people uh, who were working for him. Just finally, 74% of the public think the Prime Minister knowingly lied. That, that's a problem for like, whatever the rights and wrongs were, that, that is a problem for him, isn't it? Well, I don't think that's a fair reflection. I think the Prime Minister said what he believed to be the case. Now, it is really important to remember. Uh, that it is deliberately mislead Parliament. We all make mistakes. Mm. You, you know that, that, that sometimes you misread a figure when you're speaking in Parliament and you are allowed to, and I have, uh, put corrections um, on the record if one has got a decimal point in the wrong place or um, read a figure on the next line of one's briefing. That the Prime Minister did not believe that the rules had been broken. And when you look through... Mm. Sue Gray's report, that seems to me 
to be perfectly reasonable. The, the events he was at <coughs> were ones that, when he was there, were within the rules. Mm. Other than other than the one uh, in in the cabinet office, which. Um, it seems to me one where a reasonable person could come to the conclusion that it was um, a perfectly proper event. And Jacob Rees, just want to see, so you'll say, just to be clear what you just said, you're saying if the Prime Minister mid did mislead Parliament on this statement, he didn't, it, he didn't that, know that's really. right. That's right, that's right, and that's crucial. That's absolutely fundamental. So you think he might have misled Parliament inadvertently because he didn't have well, the well, information? He, he said no rules were broken. And we now know that rules yes, were broken. Yes, clearly. So you think he'll be exonerated by the Privileges Committee? Well, the Privileges Committee um, is, is an independent committee. It wouldn't be right for me to prejudge it. Uh, that may even be a breach of privilege itself. <laughs> so I'd better not get into um, that. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Jacob rees they're always interesting to talk to. And if you scan this QR code on the screen now, you can watch all of our interviews online and all of the previous episodes of the show. Stay with us because coming up next, Darren Harris and his incredible story of how he was electrocuted and his rehabilitation. When the COVID lockdown hit in 2020, many families struggled. For Darren, work as a scaffolder dried up and he turned to stealing scrap metal to make money but he paid the ultimate price, suffering life-changing third-degree burns. This is his story. And a warning, it does have pictures and a description of his injuries. Darren, thanks so much for coming to talk to us today. Yeah. Really appreciate it, and it's really good to see you. Um, before we get into the story about what happened to you 18 months ago, can we talk a bit about your life before 2020, your school apprenticeship, you became a scaffolder. Can you yeah, tell me about right. that? Yeah, basically in high school, um, I was in construction and then I went off to uh, do a plastering course around two years. And then halfway through, the, just about 18 months, two years, Mark, I went, I changed my trade from plastering yeah. to scaffolding. Um, and then become, I'd done a six month training course and then engaged with a part one and then yeah. a part two. Uh, I was a fully qualified scaffolder. Um, and basically, that's um, what brought me up to the, obviously being a, a scaffolder. And then 2020 comes and lockdown comes. Yeah. And work slowed down for you. Yeah. What, what happened? Did you get furloughed from the government? What, what happened with your financial um, circumstances? Basically, my financial struggles were um, I wasn't up to date with my tax returns. Right. Um, so I didn't get any help with a, a self-employment grant or get any furlough. So right. I was basically, throughout the lockdown period, I was struggling financially for funds. Um, yeah. All the building sites and everything was shut. Yeah. So I wasn't able to even find work, let alone commence any work. So I was just really in a struggle with it. Let's talk about what happened. You said previously that as a younger man in the past, you had broken the law here and there. Yeah, um, basically. But you'd left that behind, right? Yeah, so obviously in my younger days when I was struggling for money, I used to help myself to a bit of scrap out of old abandoned buildings, like places that were getting demolished and ready for demolition. Mm. So I wasn't, like, harming anybody. I wasn't doing anything majorly wrong in my mind. Just explain to us, what, it, what is scrapping? Because some people won't um, know what you're Basically, about. Basically, if you've got an old abandoned building that's getting pulled down and demolitioned, de demolished, say. Yeah. Um, obviously, when I've been on the building sites before, the site agent said to me, I said, oh, there's a load of lead on there, if you want to help yourself trick, it's only going to go in the okay. recycling side. So that's where I sort of picked it up from being a worker, yeah. being granted access to scrap from the site that I was working on by the site manager. So sort of they sort of introduced me into it by saying, oh, help yourself to this, yeah. because other people were doing it. So obviously I picked that up. It's something I shouldn't have picked up, but obviously I picked it up. And when November 2020, when I had my initial accident, I made a bad judgment of error. So do you got, had you, just before we go into that, had you got in trouble with the police about that in the past when you were a younger man? Then? Uh, I had one scrapping. or two times where I got in a little bit of trouble. And then you it. stopped doing it. Yeah, I carried on with working. You trained and, as a scaffolder. I maintained my career. Lockdown happens. And then I your just... Your dog's ill. Yeah, I just... You're desperate for cash. Yeah, so I had no sort of choice in order to go back to that sort of line mm. of work. And um, 
and, and tell us what happened that night, what happened to you? Um, basically, I was in um, an old abandoned place, I believe it's some sort of steelworks, I believe. Mm. Um, and I was doing what I was doing, collecting what I could find, sort of off the ground and stuff like that. And then um, there was like a bit of an electrical control room. Um, and obviously, I've seen the doors wide open and stuff, so I just had a bit of a nose there. And then mm. there was like copper bars inside the actual machine. But because of the way the land was situated, all being like disused and the fence and everything was open and anyone who could just walk on and off there, I just presumed it was off because I didn't right. see no lights, I didn't hear no noises, yeah. uh, the doors were wide open, so it's just like, just I don't know, it's just I just presumed it was off and I could sort of help myself to obviously a bit of extra cash. Yeah. Um, and within a blink of an eye, I felt my body lock up like an initial space like, I don't know, I can't, I can't find the words to explain it. But then I basically switched off. Like, I, I don't remember anything else apart from obviously dying. I believe I was dead for around two minutes, so maybe a short period of time. But obviously all of a sudden I just woke up and then started running for my life. And I hear him... So I'm you're at, on fire? Yeah, full on on fire. So all my stomach, all my clothes, I had three layers of clothing on. So after the arc flash um, explosion, all my clothes was on fire, but at this time of being in the, the room, I don't remember, I don't, it was just like, I, I remember vaguely watching my funeral take place, as daft as it sounds. Some people don't believe me, but I, it's what I remember. Um, so obviously I've run out for my life. Um, I'm on fire. I've, I've obviously with the adrenaline, I was able to run faster than the two other lads. So I should have stopped really and let them put me out. But obviously, I was more concerned about getting to the main road for safety. So I got to the main road, um, and as my friend was on the phone to the ambulance service, he said I had about 26 minute wait time. Um, and I'd literally, uh, within seconds of him being on the phone, an ambulance was passing with the blue lights on. Mm. Um, and I've ran from the car park bit where I was, in obviously in a bad way, um, and to put myself in front of the ambulance. And I knew. You went to hospital, you went to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital yes. in Birmingham. Um, what happened there? Can, I think we have some photos, actually, which you're OK if we share, aren't you? That's um, around December, I believe. Um, and I've, obviously afterwards, I got a disease called folliculitis dervicans, where I lost more hair than that. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, I've had my full face completely mm -hmm. ripped off and really done off the skin off my legs. Uh, I think the only bit of normal skin that I managed to keep was probably four or five inches on the mm. back of my neck. So everything from that point here, mm. all the way around my neck, my face, and obviously arms up to the shoulder and all my stomach, was completely wrapped in that BTM material. From that image there to you today, you look remarkably well. Yeah, I've Is come it... a long way. Yeah. And a lot of people have said to me, they said, I see burn survivors struggling for two, three years and the face looks like disfigured and morphed. And obviously, I don't think I'm that bad, considering. It's just, obviously, what I'm missing is the features that make a face. So the eyebrows, the tip of the nose, the ears, and obviously the hairline. They're the main things that build a face, and I've lost every single one of them. Mm. And just in terms of you are in hospital, you woke up, you were in, a, in coma for, for 23 days. 27 days. 27 right. days. When you were scrapping, you obviously didn't realise the implications of what could happen. No, well, obviously, to uh, you. I just I wasn't fully aware of the dangers. Um, and like I said, obviously the doors were open on the room that I entered. Um, so it's just it was just a major bad judgment of error all round. What happened with you or with the police or nothing? Um, the West Midlands uh, uh, Police Service, they sent police officers to my address where I was living in Manchester at the time, where, where I used to live with my mum. And the, I was out at the moment at the time, but they asked if I've had life-changing injuries. Mm. <clears throat> so, obviously, the mum explained to him, said, yeah, he has, he's had all this done to mm. him, that done to him. So, obviously, in my sort of mind, I've, I've had my punishment, in a sense, now. I've got the rest of my life to live with it. It must be extremely mentally difficult for you. What keeps you, go what keeps you going? Um, what keeps me going, I'd probably narrow it down to... I've been blessed with a second chance at life, because I believe 
for someone to have, like, it's a miracle to survive it, so what's the story behind that miracle for mm. surviving such a significant injury? Because, like I said, I've had the worst possible injury the human body could possibly withstand. I've suffered being electrocuted, and I've had an arc flash blast sent me catapulting across the room. Um, I've suffered uh, a lot of inhalation damage due to the smoke, uh, a gas charge, and mm. fragments of metal all just ripping me to bits. And I just, I, I believe it's a miracle that they've managed to give me a second chance at life. So that's my main, I, I don't know, I just believe it's, it, there's a reason and there's a purpose for me to be here. Because if there wasn't, I, it would have took me, but it mm. didn't take me. So you have had suicidal thoughts. Yeah, I've you've... been I've been to the worst of suicide recently, mm. and because of keep, something keeps stopping me, mm. and I'm always uh, forever grateful for all the surgeons who were involved saving my life at the Queen saved... Elizabeth. And yeah. you're a walking miracle. Yeah, and obviously all the aftercare. Because of that, I just I feel like I have to do something mm. constructive with it instead of sitting at home not doing anything about it. I want to be like a bit of an inspiration to others out there yeah. who are in a crisis so I can to sort of basically can look at me. Because I had a comment of someone, someone put a comment on one of my uh, pictures or videos I've done with their, uh, on, online. And they said, um, I've been overweight and I've struggled with mental health for many years. Mm. But after reading your story and hearing what you've, got, what you've been through, um, it's made me realise to pull my socks up. Because, in a sense, obviously, if I, if I can go through this, then other people with no actual injuries on the outside, but they're mentally unwell, they need to look at someone like me and think, hang on a minute, if he can go to the brink and come back and find light at the end of the tunnel, then why can't I? I read that you wanted to... You are thinking about whether you become a motivational speaker. Do you go to talk to kids in school? You might yeah, be well, thinking about that's petty the thing. crime. And I want to. I want to. Kind of... I want to make awareness of anyone who's doing this sort of thing, like scrapping business mm. and not aware of the dangers. I want to make them aware of the dangers, and I want to educate them to nip it in the bud and never to do this because not many people get given a chance. And I want them people in a struggle financially doing this sort of thing. Mm. Go to college, train yourself, get educated, and get a good career behind yourself. I mean, how are you managing though in terms of? You know, we've talked a lot about the cost of living crisis, prices going up. How are you? Ma how are you managing, or do you? Do you need uh, more just help? about, just about manage. Yeah. I've got a bit of family and support yeah. about me, but it is difficult. It's a lot. Obviously, the money that I'm on at the moment with benefits and stuff, it's a hell of a lot less than what I was earning working mm. by a quarter. Do you know what I mean? So obviously, it's difficult, but I've, I've just have to manage with what I've got and live with what I've got. And find another, and also find a new career, if you like. You know, you've yeah, got to yeah. find a... Because I'm still relatively young, I'm 29, I'm 30 29. in October. So it'd be a shame for me to sit away and waste my life and just do nothing and then cause pain for other people and all sorts like that. I want to I wanna do something mm. constructive and be an inspiration to yeah. others. That's what yeah. I want to do. Because well, I've, you... I've still got my mind, like, even though yeah. the appearance has changed... You've got your body, though. Yeah, know. yeah, my heart's still beating. I'm still the same person as what I was before. And it, it, I'm, it, I'm still Darren, do you know what I yeah. mean? But yeah. obviously, I just look different. And is that hard, looking different? Yeah. Cos I, I think you look great. Thank you. You look really well. I do, considering what I've been through. But, but obviously, is that very hard to, when I look to, at, to look in the mirror? Yeah. Because you know what you did look like. Yeah, so obviously, in my eyes, what hurts the most is, obviously, the face that I was born with and the face that everybody knew me mm. as Darren has gone and it's never coming back. Mm. And there's, no matter what I do in the world, that face will never come back. So what people remember me what I, as is gone. And it's really disturbing to think of that as well. And it hasn't been... We yeah, were talking yeah. about, it's not been very long. It's no, been 18, 18 months, months. So, actually... To... So, I, as I look now, this is the worst I'll ever look. Um, I've not had any reconstructive surgery yet. I've not had my microbladed eyebrows or my hair transplant. Or, or, the main thing I'm going for at the moment is bioprinting, bioprinting right. technology. So, there's three ways of reconstructing an ear. Mm. You can have uh, magnetic clip-ons, uh, mm. like a silicone, or you can have uh, rib reconstruction where they tamper mm. away at your ribs and rebuild the cartilage out of the ear, out of your ribs, sorry. But then you're relying on a surgeon's technique to sculpture the ear. 
But there's a third option, which just come out relatively new, uh, at Swansea University, and a few other companies in the world, like uh, Australia and China, are doing it. Mm. So basically, they take your stem cells from your body, um, they put some whatever material with it, and then they can 3D print Mm. The cartilage, it's a living ink. It's so they can, they can go on pictures of my old ear, the mm. dimensions of how it used to look. And they can, and they can read. They can 3D print that ear so in time... I so should have, have your, they'll reconstruct your ears, To how it used to look eyebrows. on a picture of my old face. What would you say uh, to young men, to people, to people struggling either with making them ends meet, struggling with how they look, how they feel about themselves, struggling with depression. What, what's, your, what's your message? My message to anyone out there attempting this sort of thing is to don't even contemplate doing it. Mm. Because, one, it's not worth it. You can get into trouble and get in, in prison for it. Mm. Two, if you do do it and you, you could end up dead or you could end up looking like me and having even more problems, because mm. even though I was in a financial struggle and I had my own issues going on before the accident, mm. since the accident, all my problems have multiplied by thousands. Mm. So I don't, I wouldn't, what I've been through, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. Mm. I just wouldn't. And Darren Friday, when you look back on that day, just before you went into that yard, what would you, what would you say to yourself now? Do a U-turn, walk away. Mm. But I can't turn the clock back. Do you know what I mean? That is something, if you had a stop, watch the show, stop, go back in time, I'd love to do that. Mm. But obviously, I can't physically do that. I can't change the matter of time. But... All I can do is the, the time that I've got left in my life and what the next journey, my next chapter in life, is to do better and do well from it. Well, I'm sure you will. And yeah. thank you so much for coming and telling us your story today. I really liked meeting you. I really enjoyed it. Thank no worries. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Darren's incredible story. Look, if you or anyone in your family is struggling with their mental health or having suicidal thoughts, please call the 24-hour Samaritans hotline on 116 123. Stay with us. Coming up next, Dee Kopang and Fiona Button talk to me about their big TV drama. What was the last show you binged watched? For years now, TV has been the new silver screen, with many Hollywood stars choosing television over movies. The Split is one of those shows that has captured that at-home audience, including me. I spoke to the director, Dee Copan, and actor Fiona Button, who you may know as Rose. What are you doing tonight? Uh. Oh God. Rose? Uh, no, no, it's me, it's me. I. I've been putting out these really confusing vibes. I was going to ask if you could babysit tonight. I've got a date. OK. Right. Well, yes, of course, because you're a normal human being. Dee and Fiona, thanks so much for coming in today to talk to me about the split. Um, you are to blame uh, for me being very tired at work because I binged watched this oh, and stayed sorry. up to three in the morning. <laughs> so it's all your fault that I've got bags of eyes. But it's an absolutely brilliant uh, drama about divorce. Uh, I think it's been really popular from what you're saying in terms of how many people have watched it. Yeah. But, I mean, I absolutely loved it. We'll get into a bit more of, of the characters and as we go along. But, Dee, let's start with you, because it was your debut uh, as a director. Yeah. And it's been, as I said, really successful. Were you... Did you expect to get this type of reception? Like, when you were making it, did you think... This is this is good stuff. Uh, I mean, <laughs> every day, every day, every yeah, day. especially her since <laughs> gold. Um, no, I mean the response has been extraordinary. I think it's been quite overwhelming, actually. I, you know, I knew it was a really loved show, um, which is always slightly terrifying because when you come onto something that, that's the third season. And, uh, and you know how many people love the show, you feel a little bit like you've joined the relay race and you're doing the final, like, 100 metres and you're about to be handed the baton and you've just got this fear of just, like, just don't drop the baton at the last sort of hurdle. But, um, but yeah, so I definitely felt the pressure of that. But, um, but I, you know, and I obviously I knew, I knew it was special when we were shooting it and, I, you know, I loved the script so much and Abby's scripts are incredible and, obviously, to, to be, you know, to be working with such a great cast, I... You know, I hoped it would do well, but it has definitely exceeded all sort of expectations. Yeah, I think it's you... been quite, yeah, just quite amazing how 
well it's been received. And you didn't um, drop the baton, in fact, I reckon yeah. you smashed no. the race. <laughs> she absolutely, you? she overtook uh, all the like other runners. And Fiona, you, your, your rose in, in the series, you're the, the youngest daughter mm -hmm. uh, with these two sort of power sisters, but it, uh, my, my view of it was that you are the kind of warmest character, really. Um, what was it like going through uh, the three series? Because Rose has a really difficult time uh, in the third series. She struggles with infertility and then she loses her husband. Was it, was it hard to play those scenes? They, they, I mean, they made me cry. They were very emotional. Yeah, um, I was pretty... I mean, I've said it before, I was pretty intimidated by the by the scene where she finds out that her husband has died. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of it's like a mixed blessing, because you get that as an actor, you get, like, a something really big happen to you, something, you know, tragedy, and you're like, yes, you know, great, I get something to get my teeth into, and then, oh, God, actually, but I've got to do it, and I've got to do it well, <laughs> and I've got to do it believably and do justice to, you know, p viewers who've watched it, who've lost... Mm their partners and, and and then it just is terrifying. So I was terrified. Um, but it kind of helped in a way. And Dee, on the subject of divorce, you, you might think of it almost as a subject of box office poison. I mean, it's something that many people <laughs> go through, but it's a horrible experience. Yeah. Um, but in this series, as I was saying, the characters are relatable, they're struggling with problems that many people struggle with. Divorce has actually been quite a fertile subject to, to to tell stories about, right? Yeah, I guess so. And I mean, obviously, it's you know it's a testament to Abby's Abby's incredible writing with this. But um, uh, you know, and obviously this this was always supposed to be a three series um, show, which was always supposed to be can you have the good divorce? So obviously that yeah it, that was really the aim of it. I think also yeah. she was her aim was I think. The reason why perhaps there haven't been many dramas about divorce is because there's always a certain amount of shame that's attached. Mm. And so people don't really want to talk about their own divorce, but mm. it, it just so happens that one in three marriages end in divorce. You don't have to be a family lawyer from London in a, a really fancy house. I think it's, it's, a, it's really a look at love and family and the messiness of life, and it doesn't really matter where you're from or, or what your background, but it's, you know, it's, yeah, it's love, family, relationships, divorce, affairs, trying to get pregnant, losing a baby. It's, you know, it's something that everyone is relatable it's for a lot of people. Mm. And, and it feels very raw as well, very raw and very real. And I think that's a testament to Abby's writing is she's just, she's got this such a way with words that it's, it's, her dialogue is so yeah, real and so real, relatable. Yeah. Second visit in as many weeks. Yeah, I was just uh, clearing out James's stuff. Oh, thank you. Um... Very efficient. Yes, they do that. Yeah. Must have been hard. Oh, um, oh God, no, no, no. I've been longing to get rid of some of that stuff for ages. 70s Afghan coat was never coming back in. A lot of the projects you've been involved with, be it The Split, Bridget and the Crown, yeah. they're female-led. Is yeah. that something... Important. You worked on projects that are predominantly about promoting women, or did it just happen by chance? I think it's it's a combination of the two. I think it's yeah, it's slightly started off by chance, but I guess it's what you're attracted to and what you're kind of interested in and what sort of yeah piques your interest really. But yes, I am. I, yeah, I guess that's probably the thing that turns my head the most. But um, obviously not just exclusively on female projects in the future. But I think coming on board this show was really exciting because it's a really strong female team, female, you know, Abby Morgan, female writer, creator, exec, two female execs, a sister pitchers who are, you know, very strong female-led production company. Um, yeah, it was, all, it was lots of strong women um, in, in great positions making this. Yeah. Female grip. Yeah. Huh? First, female yeah, fe grip. Female grip um, as well. Yeah, which is really rare um, for us to have a key key grip who's yeah. a girl. So, yeah. The, the whole thing in the industry for a long time has been that there's an absolute paucity of, of, of women directing films that films and, and series. that there, there's, there's women, lots and lots of women across the industry, but when it comes to those 
those big those big big jobs mm. it was being predominantly male do, do you do you feel you get the same opportunities as your male counterparts or maybe in the past you didn't but it's changing I think it's really changing I mean I, I've been quite lucky because I, I sort of came up um I, I came up through the ranks and I, I used to self shoot a lot and do a lot of camera work so I've, I've come up in in quite a predominantly male um area but I but I, I kind of I knew my craft and I was you know, it was fine. I, I never really had any issues, really. But I, I think there are definitely uh, more opportunities now, and I think there are some amazing women coming up through it, and obviously we're seeing the success of so many great female directors that that's opening doors, and, you know, it's that sort of sending, you know, sending the elevator back down for the others, and um, I feel that's, that's happening now. We're approaching hard times as a country in terms of the cost of living. Um, do you think that in a way that people are going to want more escapism, that they're going to want more sort of shows like this where they can just lose themselves? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think so. You uh, look at the success of Bridgerton in lockdown as well, that was, an, you know, another one that is, you know, total escapism. Uh, I think people do love seeing yeah. that. But, but with this as well, it is important, although they have, you know, wonderful, amazing, incredible lives and very big houses and wonderful kitchens and incredible they locations. They do have good kitchens. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. But, you know, it's still... They have all the same messiness and complications as everyone else, with you know, with certainly in the family. Yeah, and yeah. I think... I I think there has been a shift since the pandemic, though. I mean, mm. I don't know. I can't speak for the entire country, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but, like, I think maybe there's less cynicism in a way. Like, mm. when we want... With, with our TV choices, like, we want to watch something that has heart and, is, uh, and is, isn't ashamed of that mm. and isn't ashamed to say, like, we love and we love strongly and we feel things mm. and talk about, you know, feelings in that way, in that kind of explicit way that Abby does. Mm. And... Just to end, uh, D, which is your favourite character? <gasps> <gasps> Present oh, company. You can't exactly. I can't pick someone kick. that's not you in a minute. Okay. That's, oh that, you know, gosh, it's who's... so hard. It's that's it literally like asking someone to pick their favourite child, child, kind of. Like, I love them all do... equally. No, no, I can't. Yeah, I can't, I, it's just. But, it's not that you love them all equally, it's just that you love certain things about each of them so much. And I think, you know, any well, any show that you do, and you probably feel the same with the things you pick, you have to love the script, you've got to really mm. love the project, because you've got to fall in love with every character. But there's a weird thing, though, where uh, Ruth is it, it, exactly like my mother, it's really strange, <laughs> <laughs> which is always, always quite bizarre. But, um, yeah, I don't think I can pick. OK, you're, really you're not going to... That's fine, you don't have to. <laughs> and, Fiona, excluding Rose, who was your favourite? Who's your favourite character? Character? Mm. It's so hard because it's hard to separate the character from the actor now. Yeah. Right, OK, so I, if I So, you know, I, it, it's hard to be, like, to, to talk about them without the performances because they're so part of yeah. who they are. Well, let me ask you, to, what was your favourite bit about playing Rose? How about that? Uh, yeah, definitely playing with playing with those people all the time, getting to play with Hannah and mm. Nina, with uh, Nicola and Annabelle and, and Debs. Yeah, they're like the sisters everyone wants, really, I Completely. thought. <laughs> so thanks so much. Thanks, Thank Dee. You. Thanks, Fiona, for coming to talk to us today. Thank you very thanks much for having us. us. Loved it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's all for today's show. Thank you to all our guests, Dee Copan and Fiona Button, Darren Harris and Jacob Rees-Mogg. And thank you for watching.